So yes, what is SASA? Uh, SASA stands for Save Ancient Studies in America. Um, our mission is to reverse the downward trend in ancient studies by engaging the public and bringing together students and scholars to share their passion for the ancient world in order to inspire a vast new generation of students. So basically any kind of ancient studies discipline and we do research on the downward trend to try and figure out the best ways to reverse it basically and get people taking more ancient studies classes at the university level. Um, Matt, you can go to the next one. Um, these are just our social media tags. So we post pretty much five days a week, sometimes seven days a week about all things ancient, pretty much mostly Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then all of our live streams are like the recordings are posted on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook as well. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, just some protocol for the live event. Please be kind and respectful. Listen and ask thoughtful questions throughout the event. Please send in your questions during the event. Like these are for you guys to ask questions about what you're seeing, questions you had about the game or Archeo gaming in general. Um, be patient with technology and those administering it. Uh, again, SASA live themed. Uh, usually they're streamed on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, but Archeo Gaming is only live streamed on Twitch. And then all the recordings are posted on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. And of course, have fun. Um, Matt, you can go to the next two slides very quick, basically. Again, the next one is just showing this is what um, a Plague Tale Innocence, that's what the game looks like. Um, and then pretty much we can get started. So I'll hand it over to Tino. And thank Great. you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Lauren, for your enthusiasm, as always. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me... Okay, so this is this should be working. And you should see our little um, camera in the bottom so above me is matt <laughs> and in the upper right corner is sasha uh who are joining me today matt is the one who's going to be playing the game um, and sasha is uh, is going to also answer um any question that you have so i will let them introduce themselves in a minute um so you know who they are and what they specialize in and what they can help you with um as always i'm tina i'm your host um, I think you know me by now, but let's repeat it again. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, doing my PhD in archaeology of Israel, Palestine, um, and religious studies. Um, what else should I say? I'm very interested in everything that has to do with ancient Judaism and early Christianity um in the middle east but of course now i do these archive gaming sessions as well so i'm very interested in video games um and how they can help um us historians and archaeologists to communicate um, our historical knowledge with a broader audience but also how the audience is receptive um to these kind of video games and how we can kind of collaborate um and have fun with these things with these games while also um, adding a, a educational um, trait to them. Um, so that's kind of what I'm here for. Uh, so enough about me, because I, you know, you've heard me plenty of times every single week. Um, so I will hand it over to Matt uh, Winter, who is going to introduce himself. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I am Matt Winter. Uh, my PhD is in anthropology. Um, but I specialize in archaeology and particularly the archaeology of the ancient Near East. Most of my research focuses on urbanism and architecture uh, as a means to express identity, um, but I also uh, do quite a bit of stuff in um, the archaeological sciences, especially metallurgy and the archaeology of technology. Uh, and social network analysis is um, another really big area of uh, my, my work. Um, I just recently finished off my PhD in August of 2020, so I'm Woo! fairly new, <laughs> uh, and I am currently at the University of Arizona, uh, where I teach uh, world archaeology courses and also um, first and second temple period Israel uh, courses uh, as well. And I will pass it off to um, to Sasha. Hi everybody, uh, I am Sacha Kaki. I am a French uh, archaeologist and a biological anthropologist. Uh, uh, my work focuses mainly on uh, ancient plague epidemics, mainly uh, the medieval plagues, Black Death and, and, and other uh, epidemics in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, 
And so as a biological anthropologist, I work mainly on the, on the burial remains of these epidemics and on the human skeletal remains that uh, derive from these burials. And I work on the epidemiology of plague in, in ancient time and also on the, on, the, on the route of transmission of the disease uh, during this, uh, this ancient epidemic. And uh, I'm currently working uh, um, as a junior researcher in uh, the CNRS, which is a, a research institute in France. And I'm working in Bordeaux in uh, southwest, southwestern France. So basically uh, the place where uh, the game we will see today is, is, a, is a, yeah. I mean, it's the place where, where, where uh, the game uh, is happening. Yeah, it's amazing. We couldn't find anybody who is more qualified than you, right? You studied <laughs> the Black Plague and you live in the city where this game takes place. I mean, this is, you are like the man to, to talk about this, this game. Um, so thank you for coming on and accepting our uh, invitation. And I'm sure that we'll learn um, a lot from you uh, today. So thank you, Sasha. Um, and also Matt, of course. Um, I think we should just delve in. Um, as Lauren said, please um, write down your questions in the in the chat. Um, anything that 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 crosses your your mind, and uh, we will try to answer them. But uh, let's delve into the game and see what it is about. All right. So, um, so did you want to just go ahead and start with a particular chapter? Um, no, just you can just um, start the game uh, as, as where you are, and maybe um, let's start with a little introduction on what the game is, what kind of genre is it, what is the story, what do we need to know to understand uh, what is happening here in this scene. Okay, so in this scene here, so the game is uh, set in um, 1348. It's uh, set in the middle of the Hundred Years' War between France and um, England. So what you see marching around here are these English soldiers. Uh, the genre of the game, oh, and uh, because of the, uh, in the middle of this uh, Hundred Years' War, of course, the, um, the Black Death, uh, the bubonic plague, uh, emerged in all over, all over uh, Europe. So you have sort of this conflation of uh, catastrophe of the Black Death, um, mm -hmm on top of layered on top of this uh, sort of geopolitical conflict between France and um, England. Uh, you play as uh, a young girl named uh, Ami, I think. Amsi, something like that. Uh, Ami, Ami. Yes, something, something like, that. like that. Ami, uh, I don't know, something like that. Uh, Ami, I think. And uh, her young brother, which you can just barely see down there, crouched around oh, yes. uh, <laughs> in the in the grass, uh, Hugo. And Hugo has a special connection to the plague. And of course, at this level of the game, you haven't discovered what that connection is yet. Uh, so uh, where we're at in the game, um, the, the two children are fleeing from their home uh, where the Inquisition, um, which is another added political layer on top of this is uh, wow. is uh, but not the uh, Spanish Inquisition or the or the or anything really affiliated with the church if you actually play through the game you see that this is sort of a, a fantastical version of what the Inquisition was um, mm -hmm. and they are chasing after Hugo because they believe that he has the power to control the plague in some particular way so that um, is revealed a little bit later on in the game exactly what that is. Uh, so they're running from their home. Um, they, uh, their mother and father have just been uh, killed um, and they're trying to escape to a, uh, an alchemist named um, Lauren, Laurentius, who his mother, Hugo, their mother had been working with to, to help cure um, whatever was ailing Hugo. Uh, um, what were your other questions? Uh, the genre of the game, it's a very stealth-oriented game. It's its not very combat-heavy. Uh, you really try to sneak around, which is why we're sort of crouched in the grass while this um, English soldier is bored out of his mind walking around in a circle. And it's, it's not really open world, huh? so it's not like what, how we did Assassin's Creed a couple of months ago, where you can just go and explore. 
this month this game is a, is a little bit more linear where you have specific tasks and then when you finish a task you can go to another another level right correct yeah this is what we call a gallery style game um, where you have sort of this environment over here but in an open world environment of course like i see that windmill up on the hill over there and mm -hmm. i would just be able to run to it and of course we can't do that in this game so um, you are sort of directed around how you can how you can move through the environment Great. So let's try sneaking around and not get caught. The landscape is beautiful, though. Look at that light on the mud and the and the wind and the weeds. Yeah, the the, the graphics on this game are are really quite lovely. Gorgeous. So um, let's see. What is she wearing? I am not an expert in medieval clothing, so I don't think I can really comment on that. She's definitely wearing something, uh, she was wearing something different earlier in the game. And, um, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to move the camera, but she keeps spinning. So yeah, she, has like, she has like this kind of a uh, uh, elbow piece that looks like it's from one of those knight armor yeah, and, and her main weapon of choice is a sling, so um, when there is combat, it, you do have to use the sling, and that happens sometimes. Uh, but really, the game tries to direct you to be as sneaky and stealthy as possible, um, mm. and, and not just not uh, attract the attention of, of the enemies. Um, so I'm going to try to sneak in here and grab some rocks. I mean, I could... Uh, hurl my sling at these two guys, but that would probably be a bad decision. So you are in the southern of France, right? You know, I don't know where the game takes place. Uh, it doesn't really say. Um, the, all of the villages and the cities are, as far as I recall, are unnamed. Um, mm. But the developer studio is, is based in uh, Bordeaux. So... Um, I would suspect, yeah, it's probably situated somewhere down that, that particular area. Yeah, this is a really good example of um, authenticity versus accuracy. Um, a lot of people in the in the archaeo gaming community, uh, historians, um, want to see a lot of historical accuracy in games, of course, with real cities and real places. Um, this game does not do that. This game does not bring to life ancient or medieval um, cities that really existed and try to make them look as historical, realistic as possible. They just want to give you a feeling of the time, right? So it's, it's fiction, um, but they try to immerse you uh, in the feeling of being in 14th century France by using certain architecture that existed, by using clothing styles that existed although not 100% correct it's more about you having the impression or the feeling that you're that you're in that time and space correct um, and i think a, a really good illustration of that would be to maybe jump back a chapter where you where you move into the uh, where you move into the village for the first time and, and actually encounter the plague um, that might be a good chapter to play mm -hmm. okay let's do that um, let's see I'm going to go to the main menu. Um, it's, I just realized for the first time it's actually kind of difficult to play a stealthy game when you have all the sound down because, of course, in a stealthy game you're, you're listening for you know, your sound mm. cues <laughs> for when, when people are alerted to your presence. Um, but you know, in these days they should really uh, take into account people with um, different abilities. Um, you know, somebody who, who who can't hear very well should have other cues that they could toggle on uh, to play these kind of games. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, games have been really good about getting um, new controller designs to help people um, who otherwise would not be able to access these kinds of Oh, yeah. I so. just saw the new Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and I was so impressed with all the um, things that you can toggle on and off. You can, for example, uh, there are different ways to set the color scheme for people who are colorblind. So you can take out all the reds, or you can take out all the greens, or you can just play it in black and white. I was very impressed by those uh, 
those options. For sure. Yeah, I've been playing that game on the side. Too. Oh, here's. <laughs> so let's see while this is loading, and um, Sasha, I would I would actually be really interested to hear what your um, what your comments are on as we move into the into the village and actually encounter the 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 way that they were sort of quarantining people um, in the plague to see. Um, to see if that's accurate at all or not. Mm. What a beautiful question. So, you wish you... Oh, when we when we just get into the town, we'll be coming up into the town here. So this is the the chapter where they have just escaped their um, their their family home um, and ran away from the Inquisition, and this is the first time that they realize that there's a, a plague going on. That something. Something fishy is going on here. So come into this town, get a really beautiful view. Yeah, it's beautiful. Really a lovely view of a of a very typical kind of hilltop medieval town. That you might see. Little goose. It's very detailed. <laughs> Chicken running around. Yeah, the developers were were uh, put a lot of love and labor into this game. I think. I I think so. I mean, for not like we said, not being historically accurate, uh, they could have gotten away with a lot less than than these kind of details. You know, you see the tracks in the mud of the cartwheels and the horses. Um, it's very impressive. Sure. Yeah. Look at that. So here we're coming into this village, and again, this is an unnamed village. Um, so I, I've never been to um, a southern French village, so I can't comment on on whether this is accurate. But yes, I have been right. to Italian it's ones. What your town looks like? <laughs> yeah, I have been to Italian ones, and this looks very similar to that. Go ahead, Sasha. So I visited a lot, of course, of, of uh, southwestern French villages, and, and and that's true that it's quite accurate because this is a place with a building with uh, two floors and small uh, small alleys and so on. So it's actually quite close. Even uh, you you see the the architecture with uh, with wooden um, uh, elements on the first floor is very typical of of. Uh, of places like in, in Dordogne and, and these kind of places in Lot, which mm -hmm. is, I think, the place where the, the game is supposed to, 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 to happen. Uh, because if, if I understood well, uh, according to what I've read, it's supposed to, to take place in, uh, in, uh, in a place which was called, I can't remember, it's, uh, sorry, I cannot remember, but it's really in the southwest of France. Can be in in, in Dordogne, for example. Uh, it's it, yeah, it was called the Gu Guyenne at this time, and it was uh, in the, in the yes in the southwestern quarter of of uh, France. So it's actually quite accurate uh, regarding what we actually have as uh, medieval uh, villages that are still preserved. Really. Yeah, I was just looking at that door. Can you go back to the door? Or like just at the, at the, at the windows, how the glass is so well done. And just, you see the little like, because they didn't have the ability that I know um, of making these big glass panels as we have in windows now, right? So they could only make little pieces of, of windows at a time. So it's really beautifully done here. Yeah, this is this would be a style of glass called. I mean, I can I can comment on the architecture because that's sort of my area. Um, Go ahead. But uh, yeah, this would be like a leaded glass. So uh, yeah, you're absolutely correct that the 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 window panes would not be very big. So you would have this kind of lattice structure inside there, like you see there, um, and then uh, and then you would fill those panes with um, with glass. One thing that I actually did notice is. Uh, here again of accuracy versus so how did you phrase it earlier accuracy versus authenticity yes um so I, here for example the roof tiles would be 
uh, accurate but not authentic. Uh, so roof tiles were used quite extensively in medieval France, but the style, this S-shaped style, um, mm -hmm. is not found in uh, medieval France. You would actually see more of a scalloped um, ceramic style or just a flat, it's called a beaver tail style of uh, mm -hmm. roof tile. So again, just something really, really small, uh, but it you know okay. doesn't take away the effect of the game at all, really. Um, that is super fascinating. Yeah, I also see like on the building on the right, like in between that those wooden panels, uh, there's like this uh, fish. Is that how you call it? Fish bone motif. Oh, the herring bone uh, motif. Of, like the bricks. Here. Yeah. Yes. Of like the brick being being put in a certain structure in a certain yeah way. Hmm. So let's go through here, and then uh, as we come up, um, we'll see for the first for the first time that uh, you start to see the houses that are um, marked off for quarantine. Um, you know, should I put captions on so you can so the perhaps yeah. That would that would help. Because then you can uh, you can hear what the I don't know if it'll be under audio. Language. Just put subtitles. Okay. And just just for. Uh... I I by the way always put subtitles on any game that I play. I never know what background noise is going to be in my house, and I want to be sure <laughs> to capture it all. Okay, I think that should do it. Yeah, I, I never play with subtitles. If I if I ever see anything in subtitles, I just get too distracted reading the subtitles. <laughs> I see Americans; they're just not used to it. Okay, let me step in as an American and say that I have subtitles on literally everything that I watch too. So I, maybe and um and we're watching TV and I'm like, uh, could somebody turn on the subtitles for me, please? Thank you. Sorry. I yep. I'm so much more used to it, and then you don't miss anything. And when you when they exactly. use the words, you can read it to make sure you know what they said. <laughs> And the spelling of names and places, I just, I need to see it. So here we've come full circle around, and again, I'm just sort of showing a little bit of what the town is like. Yeah, it's good. Um, like a little bridge here. And we'll go back, Over. and then, so as they come up through around this bend, you get the lovely little icons stuck in the wall there. Um, yeah, mm, the statue. Yeah. And again, I've seen these in, uh, I haven't explored much of France outside of Paris, and my knowledge on this is pretty slim, but I've seen something very similar to this in Italy. Uh, so I would assume that this is fairly accurate. Yeah, I, I also, that's. I think this is another example of, I wouldn't know who this particular saint or whomever it is, is, uh, but it looks like it could be a religious saint or martyr or somebody. Yeah. Okay, so this is interesting, and this is what I want to hear from Sasha. So I've played the game myself in the past, and so they explain that the, the plague is going around in this in this place, and every door that has a white cross, somebody inside has or had the plague, and so they're thinking this place is now contaminated, um, so you shouldn't go in. Um, it, Sasha, can you explain to us if that is was that true? What what was the re what was the reason for this, etc. Yeah, so actually it's true, but it's not true for this time period uh, because um, as far as I'm aware, the, the practice of, of putting crosses on, on, on the world of houses of people who died from plague only uh, occur in the, in the 15th or 16th century, not during the Black Death as far as I know. And so it was actually to yes to 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 make clear that that this place has been infected by by the by the plague uh, 
because of course during the, the Middle Ages and, and the modern period, uh, people were not aware of the way uh, the plague uh, uh, infected people, and uh, mm -hmm. the the most common theory was uh, that it was caused by miasma, uh, which were uh, some corruption of the air. And so, of course, if you were close to someone after, uh, who suffered from the plague, you can possibly transmit by this miasma. And so the place was was uh, unhealthy. So uh, one particular thing what what was done at this time was to to burn some some uh, wood or spices to uh, to change the, the smell of the air because the smell was considered to, to be the the materialization of of the of the miasma oh so they they would think that a face mask doesn't work because you can still smell yes exactly uh, actually uh, later on, on on the 17th century uh, uh, doctors start to uh, to to wear this this uh, this mask you, you know with the the, the big uh, you, you probably have already seen this this costume uh, but mm -hmm. the point of of uh, the the nose of of, uh, of the mask was to put uh, some uh, some spices inside for the odor so it was not directly to make protection uh, for some kind of bacteria or so on because it was not known at this time but it was to to, to put some some odorous matter in 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 the nose Wow, so 500 years later or 400 years later after this, they still hadn't figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, the, the, the cause of the plague and, and, the, and the, the, the root of transmission of the plague was, was discovered only uh, at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the third plague pandemic. Uh, and so it started in, 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 in uh, Hong Kong mainly. And so there were many doctors from from France, from Germany, who went to Hong Kong to try to to track the the cause of the of the plague, and they they discovered at this time uh, the bacteria the bacteria which caused the plague. But before the end of the 19th century, uh, nobody knew uh, what uh, what was the, the exact cause of the plague. Oh wow! I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't either. It's interesting that you say that there's uh, that they use spices because there's a scene coming up here in a bit where they go into a um, a monastery and they see that the monks had been uh, putting spices into their water while they were taking a bath. Did they do things like that as well? I never heard about that, but it's possible. I, I'm not sure actually for. The, the fact of drinking uh, some spices, not sure. Mm. Would they also burn? Because uh, I saw a couple of burned down, you know, people and houses. Would they also burn down houses when there was plague manifested? In it? Mm, actually, not so much. What, what happened later, also in the in the 16th century and 17th century, uh, is that. Most of the of the people who suffered from plague were were put in in uh, infirmaries, and these infirmaries were generally made of of wooden battlements, wooden buildings, and these buildings were generally burned uh, down, burned out after after the the end of the epidemic. But I'm not sure the, the houses of the people were burned. Mm, okay. uh, I, I don't think so actually because yeah, you know it's. Difficult to to burn out for the city for the, for the people. Die. <laughs> yes, it seems easy to put a couple of burned down houses in it in a video game, but then if you think about it for yourself, it's a big step to burn down your own house <laughs> or your neighbor's house. Can I just jump in and ask a question that's along those lines? Because they were showing them like burning people alive. Did they burn people alive? <laughs> I think this was the Inquisition in this video game right yeah so you that? have you have well the villagers are doing this uh oh. in in that particular scene um but of course yeah you do have the inquisition and and i'm not sure if um i mean i i would assume and sasha you can correct me on this but i would assume that a lot of a lot of superstition would have been wrapped up in in how the 
plague spread. And so, you know, of course, witches and um, that sort of thing would be would be the first thing to blame. Sure. So actually, the main theory was that that it was a punishment of God for 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 for, for punishing the the people for their sins. But mm-hmm. other theories were that um, some people, so generally uh, foreigners or or uh, poor people, or even Jews, were accused to uh, to cause the plague by uh, by and spread the plague by, for example, poisoning the wells and poisoning the, the rivers. And so, some some of these people, uh, and notably the, the Jewish community, uh, was harassed, and uh, and some people were even killed. And, and there were some, yeah, some. Some big events, for example, in, 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 in Germany and in uh, northern France, uh, many Jewish uh, communities were, were harassed and, and, and sometimes uh, many people were killed. So nothing has changed, you're basically saying. They were blaming foreigners, poor people, and the Jews. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> and tall uh, people too. <laughs> these history tend to 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 repeat uh, the same the same things, and especially when it's time of crisis, and and people search some rational uh, explanation and so on someone to blame for mm-hmm. for these difficult moments. Mm-hmm. Right. So I had I, I had a question. I have always had this question. Um, so you say um, sometimes they would put people in an infirmary when they had the plague, and then when the plague has passed, they might burn the the, the, the building. What does it mean of, for the plague to has passed? Like how does how does a plague end? Oof. This is a complicated question because we actually uh, uh, have no. Good explanation for that. You know, for example, for the Black Death, what happened is that uh, between a third and maybe 50%, 60% of the European population died at the time, mm. which is really huge. So uh, among the people who do not die, where are the people who were lucky enough not to be contaminated? And maybe a few of them also were sick but did not die. Right. So at the time, it's, it's more that most of the people were infected or are in in, uh, in an area where the plague didn't spread. So right. when there were not not much people that were not infected, uh, the, the the plague tend to to stop after most of the people were infected, and. Also related to to the route of transmission, we didn't uh, speak about that yet, about the route of transmission of the disease. Actually, the plague is is not a a disease of humans. It's first uh, a disease of rodents, uh, such as, uh, for example, marmots and rats. And so the rats are the main uh, way, uh, the main uh, reservoir for, for, for for the disease. Uh, and uh, the the rats are, are beaten by uh, fleas, and these mm-hmm. fleas transmit the disease. And when the fleas bite a rat, which is infected, and then bite a human, the human become infected. So it's also depend on the on the size of the of the rat population, because the rat will also die during the epidemic. And so at some point. Uh, all the die, all the rats will be dead of, of the disease, and cannot transmit anymore the, the disease to uh, to humans, because when it's the the flea that transmits the disease, it cannot transmit the disease from one human to another. It's always from a rat to a human. Ah, uh, okay. So basically, what you're saying, a, a, a plague doesn't end. It's just like everybody, everything is dead. <laughs> and then it, it is a way, but it doesn't really, there's no cure or there's no like, um, it's not because the weather changes or whatever that it ends. It's just like 
everybody who can have it is dead and the survivors are immune or the ones who just like by coincidence not get it and that's just it yeah the, the climate can, can play a role of course because during, during the winter the rats tend to uh, to go to the burrows and and leave the place where where they are, they are in, in their in the vicinity of, of of humans so they tend to go to their burrow for the winter for the winter and then at, at the next spring they can uh, go out again and a new happening start mm. so this is also uh, a factor for for explaining that there were some season where where the 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 epidemic were more more frequent than others right okay matt are we coming to a, a certain spot that you wanted to show uh no i've just completely frozen on my end so i don't actually even see what you guys are seeing ah it's frozen yeah it's uh we, we are seeing the two kids hiding behind some uh wooden shutter and that's about it are you still playing um the game I'm trying, but um, it's not letting me. The game is frozen on my screen, so I'm okay. seeing when I when I tap out that you're still seeing a live stream, but on yes. mine, I'm completely stuck. Oh yeah, you might have to close the game and reboot it and start from a different chapter or something. Yeah, it's not letting me get to Task Manager. That's the problem. So I can't get out of the game. So like completely, completely frozen. Oh, and around and stuff but i turned my tweet around okay i'm back okay i think we are back. back sorry about that i don't know why it just suddenly froze and didn't really give me a reason why it's okay. We, as I said, we literally. This is, this is exactly why we have our disclaimer in the beginning. <laughs> Be patient with our um, technical. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it always happens. We'll we'll cut this out when we uh, put it on YouTube. Um, but yeah, something always happens. So we're still okay on. Um, on uh, yeah. Twitch and the game and everything. is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The uh, the game is loading again on Twitch and people can hear us again. Okay. Sorry about that guys. I don't know what happened. It just sometimes games glitch and they crash and that's just what they do, especially if on anybody PC. wants to get at a new computer, I'm sure he'll be glad to give you his bank account number. <laughs> so uh <laughs> I've actually got a pretty good computer. Sometimes games just glitch. That's just so, it is true. That's just what Speaking of all, all I get, it freezes on me every so many hours. It drives me nuts, but it is what it is. Okay, so I'll actually just skip ahead to the next chapter then, because we saw, I think we saw a good amount of the village. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then I think this chapter is really good because it introduces the rats. And of course, um, Sasha, you can talk about the rats and, um, and all, all of the fun rodent stuff that you've been researching. Can I ask something really quick before we talk about rats? 
asked because we were talking about the mask and everything. And Sasha, did you say that that wasn't really this time period, though? That was later when they started wearing the creepy mask? Sorry, I'm not sure I, I, I didn't understand your question. Like the mask, like the bird face mask, and you were saying that they put the spices in the nose and stuff like that. Was that not during this time period? Yeah, so the 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 use of spices and so on was during the 14th century. So it was clearly during the, this time period. But but the 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 the, the mask uh, where you put it the the the, the spice the mask mm -hmm. it does appear uh, way later mm -hmm. in the 17th century. Okay, okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking that it was later because they don't show that kind of those masks and stuff, which is what everyone thinks of when they think of the Black Plague, right? Like that's the first thing you put in your head is rats and those masks, um, but they don't have that in the video game then. No. No. no okay. So uh, before our, our little thing crashed, so the the game was um, they had. Uh, they run through the town and escape the the angry villagers, and Amicia has to make her first kill. Um, part of the game, when you play the full game, is actually um, the, kind of the character development of Amicia connecting with her brother, uh, but also yeah. her maturing into a woman, because in, in this portion of the game, she takes her first life, even though she doesn't want to, and actually, as we come up here to the, to the altar, she's going to sort of... Um, to talk about that. And that's very much a focus of the game was this um, developing this relationship between brother and sister, but also a girl's coming to age um, as she's really thrown into this very challenging environment. Hmm. Do you know anything about the architecture of this, of this church, Matt? Sure. So um, this, uh, we can, Again, this is sort of a fictional church. It's, a, as far as I know, is not um, not a real building. But as we move through this, some of the stuff that uh, we see in this architecture did catch my eye. Um, this style of architecture would be quite common in this part of um, in this part of France. If it is um, taking place in southwestern France, this would be a Romanesque style church. Um, and everything in here looks fairly accurate. Uh, you would have the wooden building or the wooden roof. In fact, actually, this was one of the reasons why, uh, as we move throughout the rest of the building, you'll see that I'll point out an area where there's something called ribbed vaulting, uh, which is sort of a, a way that you can lighten the load. Um, so arches compress the load down from the arch into the ground, and that's how you can build these big structures. But mm. one of the disadvantages of a Romanesque style church is uh, it had to have really big arches and really big thick walls to absorb all of that pressure down. Uh, the invention of the ribbed vault, first of all, it allowed, if you look at this, I'm looking at the ceiling now and you can see that it's made of wood. Mm -hmm. um, this was a problem because they often caught on fire, um, especially because they were often the tallest structure in the, in the city. So. Uh, lightning strikes and that sort of thing. Uh, this all was right. a huge problem in um, all over medieval Europe was the roofs of churches constantly catching on fire. And of course, you know, all the mm -hmm. candles and, and rituals that are happening inside the structure. Um, so the use of the rib vault actually allowed the, the roofs to be made of stone um, because it allows for a lighter... Uh, a, a, like a, a lighter touch of stone to be used. Right. Um, and then the, the, the compression would go down the rib, so it sort of strengthens the arch. Um, and we'll see some of that later. But the other nice thing, too, is if you really think about those kind of high Gothic cathedrals, of course, this is a Romanesque-style church, um, and they were dark, as you can see in here. Mm. This is a very dark building. Um, yeah. And that was because the buildings, the walls, had to be thick enough to be able to support those arches but that meant that you couldn't put windows in so mm. with that high gothic style of architecture uh that ribbed vault really allowed for those nice really beautiful stone um mm. roofs but also allowed uh, the walls to be a lot thinner so you could put in things like um lots of windows to make sort of these really brightly lit churches interesting 
I noticed the the furniture. Would they would they have these kind of wooden benches? Because I've heard that in medieval times, people wouldn't actually sit on benches during service. They would just stand up. Or was that already at this point replaced by, by benches to sit down on? You know, I, I don't know for sure on that. There's certainly no permanent architecture um, in, in terms of pews and benches. Uh, but I would suspect that if there were benches used, it would probably be for the wealthiest people to sit in the front part of the church. Oh, yeah. And then mm -hmm. the, the back portion of the church would be open and left for standing. And if you go into a lot of cathedrals in uh, Europe today, you'll see that a lot of the seats are pushed way up to the front, up by the apse of the church. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of standing room behind. Um, mm -hmm. I think some of those cathedrals can hold upwards of you know, 10,000 people inside them if they're all standing. Oh, yeah, some of them are huge. So this is part of a monastery or something? Yeah, so it looks like you're you're in the, um, here's sort of the Clara story for the church that you can see. Really typical Romanesque style church um, where it's sort of uh, two long barrel vaults that make a cross basic style mm -hmm. of the church and if you're familiar with roman architecture this is the basilica it's the, the same basic idea you just plunk a cross on the top of it and boom church <laughs> um and then this would be the cloister inside where all the where all of the uh, the parishioners would live or the monks rather Sasha, was sulfur used? That's one of the collectible materials that you can get in this game. Was sulfur used um, extensively to combat the plague? Do you know? Not that I am aware of, so I would say no. <laughs> but I can be wrong. But then I don't think so. And here's, the, here's the point where he oh, runs in and he yeah. sees the medicinal herbs inside the tub. Oh. Oh, yeah. So it was just interesting when when uh, when you were commenting the on the on the uh, the use of the you know spices and and herbs. They have a whole jacuzzi set up there. I know. Nice. So some fine living. Multiple. <laughs> the whole space just for jacuzzis. <laughs> but you also use the sulfur in this game to. Um, to make fire, right? Because the rats are afraid of fire, isn't that? Yeah, you use it as a crafting a material. Salt, saltpeter and sulfur, and then you can create um, fire and like little explosive, uh, explosive things. So of course, that's further down in the game when you unlock that ability. Right. So it's not as much to protect your body, or whatever, but more to make fire. Uh, <laughs> Chase the way to. Would people be buried in the middle of this garden, or is this just a emergency situation? As far as I know, uh, no, they would not. Um, but Sasha might be able to comment on that. Actually, that's a question I had for you, Sasha. Was um, so you said that there wasn't or that there would be sometimes use of um, fire to kind of purify these spaces. Do we have archaeological records of uh, burned down areas or mass inhumation, mass graves, where, where we can see that this is a clear archaeological signature of a pandemic? Yes, actually we have. Uh, so for, for, for the last uh, last part of them, uh, we do not have uh, any signs as far as I know of, of uh, burned da down, uh, burned buildings and so on. But we have a lot of, uh, of um, mass graves uh, related to, to, to the plague. Uh, so most of them in Europe. Uh, in Europe, we have um, maybe 20 uh, burial sites related to, uh, to the Black Death, and maybe uh, 30 or 40 more related to uh, later plague epidemics. Wow. Uh, from the the late 14th to the the beginning of the 18th century because it's actually all the same pandemic which start which started in the in the mid 14th century and which lasts 
for the next four uh, centuries with uh, recurring epidemics during four centuries. And yes, we have, we have uh, actually thousands of, of, of skeletons of, of uh, people who died of plague uh, that we, we, we know are related to, to this disease. So yes, we have quite a lot of, of mass burial, but uh, it's only a part of, of, uh, of the, the victim actually, because probably most of them were just buried uh, normally in individual graves. But of course, these graves are, are really difficult to uh, to identify as as, as plague of, uh, the plague of the grave of uh, of plague victims, and it's it's really easier to uh, to um, figure out that big mass graves are, are related to the disease. But you would so be sorry, able to the, the, the the bones on the on the skeletons yeah, and look for um, evidence of uh, distress to the bones, or do you ever find uh, fire? burning on, on any of the bones in these graves? Traces of fire, you mean? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, the people were just buried, uh, just, uh, just the corpses were buried, but they, so not they were not... The corpses weren't burned no. and, then, and then disposed of? No, uh, actually it's, it's, it's quite uh, complicated to burn a, a body. Uh, you, need a, you need a lot of, of wood to, to burn a body. Uh, and when you you are you have a lot of a lot of victims, uh, thousands of victims, hundreds of victims, it's really uh, complicated to uh, to burn them. Uh, so it's really easier to 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 dig a hole and, and put them all together in a hole. Mm. So how does the the plague manifest in one's body? What are the, the I mean I know the symptoms are. Yeah, can you just explain what happens to you when you get the plague, and would any of those um, symptoms be visible on a skeleton? Yeah, sure. So when you are still alive and you are affected uh, by the plague, uh, the main uh, symptom is that you will have some uh, bubbles. So on on the armpit, uh, notably, you you can have this this swelling. Yeah. Uh, which are, are called bubbles. And it's actually the place where the bacteria uh, multiply before it, it spreads through, through the body and causes septicemia, which causes the death. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's the, the main symptom. And of course, you, are, you, you have some, some fever and so on, uh, general uh, uh, sickness. But, but the, the main symptom, which make it different from other diseases, uh, are the bubbles. Right. Uh, the problem with that is that, of course, these bubbles, they do not leave uh, traces on the skeleton. Mm -hmm. And because uh, you die very fast when you are you have the plague, uh, in five to seven days, you, you're dead. Oh, wow. Uh, or, or you recover, but if, if you die, you, you, you die in, in, in about a week. So the, 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 the skeleton doesn't have uh, enough time to, to create some some lesions. Right. So actually, when we find the skeleton of putative plague victims, we do not have uh, signs on the bones. So to be sure that the people die from plague and not from another disease, uh, we actually use uh, some uh, some ancient DNA uh, techniques. So we, we, we track down the, the, the DNA of, of the bacteria that can still uh, remain in, in, the, in the bone and, and mainly in the teeth. You mm -hmm. can find the, the DNA and if you find the DNA, it's really uh, specific to, to the bacteria and you can be sure that the, 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 the guy who died had plague before he died. Wow. So, so basically, if you have graves, you just have to do a, a, a specific test on the bones or the teeth to figure out if, if the plague was the cause of, uh, of exactly. the Exactly. You, you first have to, to find, to, to have some, some inch, to have some archaeological evidence that there were a mortality crisis, and then you can just test to, uh, to, to find out if, if it was the plague or another disease. Uh, yes, by, by testing on the bones. Wow. 
Can that be done for any? Because I, so I, I, like I said, I do, I do Israel Palestine. I know we have the Justinian plague in the fifth century. Would that be the same thing? And would you be able to do the same tests there on skeletons from the fifth century or sixth century? Yes, so the, the Justinian plague was between the, the fifth and, and eighth beginning of the 8th century and, and it's it's uh, it's actually the same the same disease so it's mm. the, it's really the plague mm. uh, which is not the case for example so for the Antonine plague during the 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 late antiquity it, it's it's not the same disease it's called plague by by um, the, the the historian and the writers but it's another disease more oh. most, most probably but the the Justinianic plague is actually caused by the, the same bacteria and is, uh, is uh, the same disease that during the Black Death. Huh. Great. I didn't so, know do that. You I mean, talk about the rats here. Oh, sorry, Tina. I didn't yes. Yes. Sorry. No, go ahead. We can talk about the rats. <laughs> oh, I, I, uh, so this is for Sasha. Um, just, um, I know that one of the, so why, why would the rats be kind of a, the main bad guy in this game. Can you explain the, the relationship between uh, between rats and, yes. and the plague? Yes, sure. So, as I said before, uh, the rats are, among other rodents, the main reservoir for 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 the disease. It means that the bacteria live in the rat populations and it can just stay in the rat population if there are enough rats and uh, and the the fleas of the rats have enough rats to feed themselves the pro problem starts when uh, the flea the fleas uh, have not enough rat to to feed themselves and try to to feed on other mammals mm. and one of those mammals are the humans, and if the rats are in close vicinity with the with the humans, and the, the fleas bite the humans, the humans can become infected. Yeah. So uh, actually, of course, in the game, the rats are the bad guy because they are uh, uh, the species uh, that transport the disease. Mm -hmm. But actually, the bad guy should be the, the fleas. <laughs> but I guess the game would not have been uh, so spectacular with uh, uh, people fighting fleas in the game. <laughs> or at least it would be a lot more difficult to program that. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so so in theory, if you could keep away the fleas from your body with, with like a cream or whatever, you wouldn't get the plague. Yeah, in theory. That's true. Yeah. Now, were there was there um, other were there other species that the plague could jump between? So there's obviously fleas biting humans, but do we see this transmitted into um, uh, other domesticated animals or or anything like that? Yeah, actually. Uh, so 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 the plague, the plague still exists today uh, in 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 many countries of of the world, including the the U.S. Uh, any 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 year in the U.S. there are some some maybe twenty or thirty cases of plague, uh, and most of these cases are uh, related to domestic animals, which are infected by fleas or rodents uh, that beat these domestic animals, and these domestic animals that can be infected include the the, the dogs and the cats. Huh, hmm. and they die too. Uh, I guess it's yeah. I guess it's they can die too of the disease because they are not uh, natural reservoirs such as marmots, for example, uh, are, are uh, natural reservoir and, and they don't really die of, of the disease. Mm. disease the, the bacteria live in in these species but do not die uh, them, right. which makes sense because uh, the, the bacteria need to have some some hosts. Uh, that that can live. If not, uh, the bacteria will, will disappear with uh, the hosts. Mm -hmm. Would would there be a chance that the bacteria goes from fleas to like ticks? Uh, 
you, you mean that, that the bacteria are transmitted by other uh, vectors than, than the fleas? Yes. yes. Yeah, so actually, um, there are so, some theories that uh, possibly during the, the Black Death and, and, and other medieval modern uh, plague epidemics, uh, the disease was transmitted uh, from uh, between humans and not uh, involving the rats uh, through body lice, for example, who mm. could uh, bite a human and then bite another and transmit the disease from human to another and, and, and help to, 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 to make the, the disease spread mm -hmm. in the population, which, which could uh, explain uh, why the the plague war was so deadly during the medieval period because uh, in, in more recent epidemics in the end of the 19th century, 20th century, uh, the, the death toll was really, really uh, lower than, than during uh, the Black Death. So maybe the, the route of transmission was not exactly the same during the, the Middle Ages and it is maybe why the Black Death was so deadly. Mm. Oh, that would be so creepy. I mean, ticks are already so dangerous and they're becoming more and more widespread but, but during climate change. If they would start spreading the plague, <laughs> I would not like that. Yeah, so I mean, we, we, we are lucky now because we, we know how to cure the disease. We have some antibiotics, uh -huh. which works well oh. to, to cure the disease. So, so in, the, in the maybe 20, 30 people who, who have plague, Every year in the U.S., uh -huh. most of them are cured and don't die of the disease. Uh -huh. There are maybe one, one or two guys who die a year because they are treated uh, too, uh, too late, or too, too, too late uh, yeah. and, and die because the, the treatment comes too late. But, right. yeah, actually, today it can be cured. So oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> this is, is okay. <laughs> we have to deal with other ones. <laughs> Yes, there seems to never be an end to uh, pandemics. So one thing that I noticed that uh, not to completely change gears, but um, yeah, to completely change gears. <laughs> um, one thing that I noticed that I thought the developers did really good at in sort of, again, that, that issue of accuracy versus authenticity. Uh, here, mm -hmm. this scene caught my eye when we were going through this because this is actually quite accurate. Uh, and quite authentic, actually. Uh, this is, I did look up, this is, uh, you know, it's out of my area of specialization, but I did look up what the ceramics um, were like in medieval France, what the sort of typical decorations were um, and how they would have made, uh, what were some of the typical shapes that you would find. And the developers did a really good job on this. This is exactly the kind of decoration. Uh, I wrote it down, it's called uh, scrafito uh, style decoration. Uh, this sort of light, um, kind of wavy, wisp, wisp, uh, I don't know, kind of waving in the wind uh, vegetal motifs were really, really common. And uh, this was actually a, a wide uh, distribution of this type of decoration from France into, um, into Brittany and Normandy and then into Wales and England. Um, and then the, the vases here uh, are glazed. So this is uh, a pretty typical thing that develops in the 13th or in the in the medieval period in, um, in Europe is the use of leaded glaze. Um, and this sort of caught my eye because again, I do also the archaeology of technology and, and uh, some I've spent some time looking at different kind of glazes and, slips that you might find on different kinds of ceramic wares. Um, this develops... Yeah, this is I thought that this was glass, but it's not glass, it's just glazed yeah, pottery. Yeah, it's, it's, it's glazed glazed pottery. Um, and it, it's not quite a material called faience, which is something that develops pretty early yeah. in Egypt and then into the Near East. And then it sort of, uh, faience goes away. They were using faience a little bit later, uh, but this um, kind of slipped leaded glaze that's a technology that actually develops in the middle east um, mm -hmm. and you see this especially in islamic architecture with the glazed tiles right. and then that uh that technology you do see it pretty early in the byzantine period um in, yes. in like the levant uh, but it's not making its way into continental europe until much later 
Um, but I did think that the I thought the designers did a really nice job on you know just looking up this kind of little little bit of pottery here and just giving that yeah that's flair of authenticity. Right. It's a really lovely touch. Is there other stuff on the tables that we can look at? Material culture. Are there? I'm sorry. Say again. Are there other things on the table here that we can take a look at? Other objects or um, I saw some candles. Yeah, I mean, and I got you know, none of this would really survive. I guess there's a little knife there. A wooden um, bowl. Yeah, no, none of this with some forks and, um, I don't know, I guess that's maybe how forks looked then. <laughs> I'm not really sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It is. The two... The two tiny... Mm -hmm. Yeah. The trite thingies. Um, but, you know, it, it would have been very tempting for the developers to put some kind of, you know, extravagant, plastered... Um, image here that that wasn't right. really um really what you would have seen at that point in time and um uh, again just a, a little bit of brief research showed that in fact they actually did a pretty good job representing what that would have looked like right Yeah, I, lo I looked around a little bit on the internet, and I mean, I didn't contact the makers of this game or anything, but I couldn't find any evidence that they hired the historical consultant or anybody for this game. So I would be curious to know if they just did their own internal research and some Googling, or if they had a specialist involved or not. As far as I could read, they did not. Otherwise, I think I would have found some some interview or some uh, evidence of this on the internet. I think they just did their internal research. This guy died a horrible death, not only eaten alive by rats, but in the latrine on top of it. <laughs> oh, it's pretty gruesome, all these images of these uh, skeletons. Ugh. I love how you have like a stick and not like a torch just a stick that you use yeah I, I mean I think that's one of the um, one of the attempts of the game to to get you to um, move quickly because um, if you if you saw when I had the torch of course I would just wander around and look at stuff but um, yeah oops. have you ever seen that there's like a, a YouTube video of a guy who um, does experimental archaeology and so he has uh, an expert on torches and he said every time that i see in movies that they're going somewhere uh, holding a torch and they put the torch in front of their face i get so angry <laughs> because you wouldn't see anything you need to hold a torch behind you um so that you can actually see what is in front of you you would be blinded by having the flame right in front of your face that's all you would see you wouldn't see the wall of, of the cavern or anything in front of you so people should always walk with their torch behind their head um, to have light. It's yeah. a very interesting video to kind of like demonstrate that in a cave and such. I'm like, I never forgot about that. I, would, I wouldn't have thought about that, but it also makes sense that, you know, otherwise you'd be inhaling smoke <laughs> the entire time mm -hmm. too. Right. Which I don't think would be particularly pleasant. Look so, at all those rats. Sasha, when you said earlier, I'm, I'm really interested by this um, these mass graves that you would have found. What's the about the average number that you find um, bodies inside these mass graves? And where are these graves located in the city? Uh, or are they outside the city walls and um, the ancient city walls? Uh, where are these graves located and how many people are in them? Hmm. So it, it really depends of, of various factors. It depends... Uh, on the time period, and it depends on on the size of the of the cities or villages. Um, so first, of course, when the the plague uh, struck a small village, uh, the mass grave contain only one or two guys because it's the guy who who, who died uh, the same day. Big big city, for example, uh, there are. There are some uh, some mass graves in in London or or in Barcelona uh, where you can have uh, more than uh, one hundred uh, skeletons in the same grave. Um, 
so it's yeah it really depends a lot of 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 the 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 daily their stall so of course mm. it, it's, it's very different depending on the on the size of the city uh, regarding the, the place where the the people were buried uh, during the black death actually most of the of the of the plague victim were still buried in in the parochial cemeteries with the other uh, uh, dead with the other people who died uh, in other periods and the epidemic. Uh, for the Black Death, we only have uh, two cases where uh, cemeteries were created uh, uh, just on purpose to, to bury the, the, the plague victims, and, and both these cemeteries are in, in London. Uh, they are called the West Midfield and East Midfield cemeteries, and both were used in, in 1348-1349. And, and after the end of the of the the epidemic, uh, the the cemeteries were abandoned. Mm. And actually, uh, the most of the of the cemeteries that were created for the 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 plague victims were were not contemporary of the Black Death, and they are more in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. At the time where uh, people were were put in in infirmaries and and generally the, the cemetery were in in a relation with the, the infirmary and and this infirmary and cemetery there were outside the city at that time period but it's, it was not the case most of the time during the black days. Mm. Oh, right, and we have escaped. That's uh, that's super fascinating. It's, um, I wouldn't have thought that they would have actually just been buried in the same in the same graveyards. I would have thought that you know they would have removed them and taken them somewhere else and and dug mass graves out there. Like, yeah, a bit like leprosy. That's kind of how I often imagine it. People yeah. being like out of society. Yes, but actually, it was. It was. I think. Uh, what was thought during a long time was the, the, the plague victims were just put somewhere else. And it's, a, it's really the archaeology which proved that it, it was not always the case and, and most of the victims were in, in, in uh, commun communitary uh, cemetery, uh, parochial cemeteries, which is, I think, I think for, for the burial archaeology, it's, it's important that it has proven that, that uh, the people were not excluded for from the cemetery, we are not excluded from 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 the communities. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting chapter four. Is that the the one that we started with in the beginning? Yeah. So, uh, so where we are in the game um, mm -hmm. is uh, yeah, they've escaped the village. Um, and now they are on their way to find La Laurentius. Um, you know, and one thing that actually, I don't know if there's any meaning behind this, but one thing that kind of caught my eye throughout this game is um, this idea of historical memory or the wisdom of the ancients. Um, it, it was interesting to me that the alchemist uh, uses Roman techniques and he has a Roman-ish kind of name, more more Roman than French kind of name. Um, and then throughout the game, one thing that really stuck me struck me was uh, sort of this historical memory. So as you move throughout the game, um, you'll encounter Roman ruins, or you'll uh, you'll see these really really fantastic aqueducts, which of course in southern France are are still you know the Pont de Garde is is a fantastic. Uh, example of a preserved aqueduct. Um, mm. And then, of course, uh, at some point, you sort of unlock the mystery to Hugo's problem when you go into the, the Roman bath portion of your of your family villa. Um, something that really that kind of really struck me. So, is this, so what do you think that is? Is it, is it that, that typical trope of like black, you know, dark medieval times? They didn't have a lot of scientific knowledge the Romans were the ones who who knew how the world, you know, needed to be run and have had all the scientific knowledge? 
Is yeah. that what you think? That yeah, I think that's a it's a very tropic thing that you'll see in in video games, especially games that center on archaeology. Is this idea that ancient people had kind of wisdom that we don't have, or or that knowledge has been lost, um, and you know, uh, in particular to epidemics, I would I would I would say that. You know, Sasha could probably comment a little bit more about whether they actually did know anything more, but my initial inclination is probably not much. Um, more knowledge was was had by the Romans than than by uh, later people, so I think it plays into that to that trope. But I just think also the the memory of the past is something that people often. It's a very it's a very powerful thing to. Uh, think about the past and and you know this is set in 1348 so mm. this is a population that's a thousand years removed from Rome um, right you know we're closer to them than they were to Rome um, right so uh, you know these are this is an old empire that has left its uh, fingerprints on the land and uh, if I had gotten a little bit further you'd be able to see you know, these aqueducts and these um, Roman ruins throughout the city. But, um, I don't know, Sasa, can you comment on, did, did ancient Greeks and Romans have a better understanding of the plague than medieval people did? Or were they pretty clueless too? Yeah, so for, for the plague, really, the disease plague, uh, it actually doesn't happen during the, the Roman period. So, of course, they were not uh, confronted to, to, to this specific disease, but there were many other epidemics and uh, they were not better to cure it than uh, medieval people were to, to cure the plague. Uh, so I, th I think that um, there were a lot of, of uh, famous physicians for the Roman period. Right. And, and in, the, in the Middle Ages, uh, most of the physicians were just reproducing uh, the, the concept of the of the Roman period. Mm -hmm. I think this is why uh, they consider it's, it's it's often considered that the Romans were more advanced than in the Middle Ages, but uh, they were not better to to cure uh, the disease and and uh, the treatment were basically the same, such as. Uh, 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 I'm not sure of the name, but removing blood and, and, and right. humorous. So um, it's basically what's have been done in, in, in the Roman period and it's basically what was done in the Middle Ages, that and using plants to try to, to, to cure people. But actually, uh, I wouldn't say that Roman uh, physicians were better than, than in, the, in the Middle Ages. Mm. At least uh, with respect to, 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 to understanding and, and, and curing the, the epidemics. What was the state of medicine in the 14th century? Do you know that? What, were they already like doing operations, or how did um, medicine look like? So, uh, sure, operation, yes. And during the 14th century, for example, uh, what was done is to just cut the bubbles to try to to remove what was inside the bubble. So it uh, was a surgical operation, but it was actually uh, not effective. Right. Uh, and uh, for other aspects, of course, during the Middle Ages, there uh, can physician uh, made imputation and these kind of things. Yeah. It was done, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah so it, they were basically doing the same as in the Roman period, as in focusing on the body and what you can actually see and and like the, the, the blood and then and the gall and stuff but not looking at bacteria and and, and uh exactly and, yeah yeah and, and so ancient populations were just as susceptible to this as well i mean i i know that maybe they didn't have specifically the bubonic plague but from what you've said there were a number of other epidemics did these happen at the same kinds of rates that we would have seen in medieval period because i know one thing that people talk about is well you know rome had such great sanitation 
and I've always wondered how true that actually really is. I mean, yes, Rome had a great infrastructure and great sanitation, but um, it's not like other people lived in squalor. People understood the basic kind. You go to medieval Europe and you can see sanitation and sewage and that sort of thing in the infrastructure. So um, were they just as susceptible or, or were they really actually better than other periods? Mm. I'm not sure because I'm not a guy working a lot on, on the Roman period, so <laughs> uh, Fair I don't want to, to say uh, <laughs> not accurate, I'm sorry. I, I think, Matt, I, I think also in the Roman time, we have to make a difference between the rich and the poor, right? Sure. I don't yeah, think absolutely. those in Rome where people lived in apartments put together, where they all had to go to the same public bathroom at the end of the street <laughs> was very hygienic. Um, not everybody had hot tubs or access to the to the uh, the, the thermi, ther thermi. Yeah. Now this was interesting that the destructive the the pottery that you can specifically pick up to throw is uh, decidedly not um, medieval French style, and I'm not sure why they went that way. I don't know if it was just a uh, a style that's visual so it catches your eye so you know how to pick it up um, but as someone in the southwest that actually looks a, a whole lot like uh, 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 white on black wear that you would find here in, in the southwest um, rather than something you would find in, in medieval France in West. yeah which I, I thought was I thought was interesting I don't I don't want to read yeah. into that, but I did think that was a little bit interesting. It is interesting here. The walls are made of this, uh, not mud brick, but like clay with, with straw in it. Yeah, the, not the like sort of wall and dog. Made in, uh, in stone. So there is a difference between the countryside and, and the city life architecture. Yes, for sure. Okay, so we have five more minutes. Um, I don't know, Matt, if there's still something else that you want to take us to or not. Otherwise, we just continue. But I want to give you a heads up. Um, no, this is, I, I think this is good. I think we did a good job showing um, kind of the, how the cities would have looked and, and how the gamers designed it and uh, how that compared to what we actually know about the plague and, and some right. I still think we did an amazing job with the amount of details, the little the little weeds growing and the plants um, placed around, and so I mean, I really like how they how they visually made this game to look like. Maybe not accurate, but definitely authentic. Yes. Um, I think one of the questions that people normally ask when people are sending in questions and stuff is like, how would this be used in like a teachable way in terms of using Archeo gaming in that kind of way? Hmm. Sure. So one of the things that I've um, been a bit, a big advocate for uh, ways that you can use as uh, games as a pedagogical technique are, um, Let's see if I can show it here. Is these these little things here? These little codices that pop up. Um, a lot of games will have these. Um, in this game, they they frame it as curiosities and gifts. Uh, but these little blurbs down here um, are really really useful ways that people can talk about real real artifacts, real material culture. Um, Assassin's Creed does a really good job of actually linking in real actual artifacts, pictures from, from the museum, um, and then explaining how, how these were, um, how these were discovered. You could, you could talk about, uh, what these material objects would have been used in, in day-to-day -day life. Um, so these, are, these in particular, I, I really like that game designers now really go out of their way to. I agree, Matt. I wasn't even, I, I forgot about that. Like you have Hugo's her herbarium, mm -hmm. where he like per level he finds a specific flower, and I am not a botanist at all. I don't know anything about plants, and I was actually reading 
all these entries about these plants just out of my own curiosity. Like I'm not that very interested in plants. <laughs> I don't have flowers in my house or anything, but I was just like intrigued. I'm like, oh, a different plant. What is this one? Like I was actually learning something. Yeah. And and actually when you just read through this, I mean, what we were talking about earlier with uh, with Sasha talking about uh, cleaning cleaning the, the, the boils on the body, uh, that's exactly what this is describing. Now, I don't know if carnations actually were used in that, uh, but um, I would suspect if somebody did their research on this and found that, mm. in fact, they did mix carnations with vinegar. Um, I, I don't know. I'm Sasha, you might know if that's mm. true or not. Um, but the point is, is that these are really fantastic ways to, um, to integrate material culture that is still educational and has good pedagogical value, even if it's just something kind of a subset within the game. Um, Cause I read through these and I know a lot of people do actually read through these and, and um, you know, you can learn a lot of interesting things about stuff. Right. And I think certainly for somebody who teaches a medieval class or a class on, on, on plagues or on pandemics or whatever, could totally do what we just did but in a classroom setting make a couple of save games and then go as a class together on a big screen in your classroom, um, you know, elementary school, high school, uh, university, and just like play together and talk about what you see. And, and, and just as we did um, just now, I think that would be very um, useful in the classroom. Yeah. And, and students would enjoy it and it's pretty to look at and it's a video game, so it's cool um, while being educational. Yeah. And, you know, there is value in showing inauthentic things as much as there is in showing authentic things. We don't have to get so wrapped up in showing uh, the world as it was, because the reality is, is the nature of archaeological evidence is we're never going to know that. Um, we're never going to know exactly what the world was like 100%. We can only fit it to our best guess. Uh, but allowing the creativity of these designers... Uh, who are, you know, obviously masterful artists to reconstruct these worlds for us, and then we can just get a feeling for it, even if it's, um, even if we can point out the places where it's wrong, that's still a teachable moment. Right, right, and and something that that I definitely do uh, at, at a university level class is have students read an actual um, historical paper. Um, or a primary source, and then compare that with the video game and point out um, similarities and discrepancies, because then you can really see if people understood the material. If they pick up on on the, the mistakes themselves in the video game, um, and then they'll never forget for sure. Yeah. Okay, I think we've come to the end of our, of our uh, time together. Uh, Matt and Sasha, thank you so much for being here. This was so much fun and so useful and educational. Um, you want to say a couple of closing words, Matt? Uh, well, I didn't have anything prepared, but um, yeah, thank you, thank you uh, for uh, for hosting this, and um, I hope we um, got some people interested in thinking about the nature of the plague and historical representations. Uh, Thank you so much to Sasha. You were, as uh, as Tina said, you're the perfect person to have as a as an additional commentator on this. Not only are you French, in which this game takes place, but you're a plague specialist, and that's just it couldn't be more perfect. Uh, so I really thank you for taking the time, and and especially with the time difference, to join us today. Uh, your insight was was uh, was really fascinating. Sasha? Thanks a lot and thanks for, for inviting me and inviting us to, to take part to this Arco Gaming. I actually uh, didn't know uh, this kind of initiative before you contacted me uh, one week uh, ago. <laughs> and it's actually really fun and I was really, really happy to, to take part to, to this today. And, uh, and I think it's really a, a, a good, a nice way to, to just share uh, information about uh, the past and, and what we do in archaeology and history and so on. So, so thanks right. again. That's great. I think you should totally go around now and give presentations on this video game with your back background knowledge. Just buy the game and go play it at, at, at conferences and everybody will just be fascinated with what you have to say. 
Um, okay, so guys, we will be um, back in the spring. We won't have an Art Your Gaming session in January because we're doing mini reading groups instead. So um, I think we will be back in February where we'll be playing uh, another game of our choosing. So we hope to see you then. And in the meantime, have a good winter break. Bye. Ciao. And Matt, you can stop the stream. <laughs> oh.